it is a scary time. We've had fires, we've had plagues, we've had riots, we've had a revolution that we are still in the midst of. We're looking at a sandstorm and, and plagues of cicadas and I wonder how the biblical writers would speak about 2020. And it's scary. But I told myself early in ministry that I would make no decision whatsoever based on fear because when I let fear drive my life, I have all of a sudden said, God, I don't need you. I can do it myself. So our elders and our church, our decision to not reopen currently is not based on fear. It is based on love, love of our neighbors, love of those at risk, love of our community. And we are all inundated with information. We are given more information than we know what to do with and how to sort through. The government says we can open and yet still churches are, are showing how one person comes to worship and 26 are infected from that one service and then 35 in the community and then hospitalizations and deaths. And I love those people. So I want to protect them. And when I think about us wanting to come back to church, we have to really question why? Because the church is not a building and we've learned anything in this whole thing. It's that's the lesson. In fact, in the book of order, in the very beginning sentence, as it begins to talk about our polity and who we are, it says the church is the congregation that is doing mission, doing its mission. And we are still doing that. So we continue with online worship for the time being. The elders are constantly looking at the rates in Warren County so that we can determine when it's safe to come back together in worship. In the meantime, you are invited Thursday mornings at 1130. We actually record our service. There's no singing. There is music. There is the organ. You're invited, but please call the church first if you're planning on attending. And we, as your church leaders, We'll continue to pray for wisdom, God's wisdom, not ours, not earthly wisdom or, or governmental wisdom, not policy, but God's wisdom. And as we do that, we return to that biblical aspect of waiting on the Lord. And typically I tell you that that waiting is an active waiting. It's a, it's an active hope. And this is so ironic because right now, that active waiting is staying at home and being safe and loving our neighbors and protecting those at risk. So I hope you'll join us online. And when God tells us, when we hear that call from God that says, you need to get back in church, in the building, we will listen and the invitation will be to all, everyone peace and blessings.
service, you saw a small video about what our current practice is in reopening. I hope you'll take some time to give me a call and let me know your thoughts because we're struggling over here. We don't know what to do and we want to act first out of love and not out of fear. So please feel free to call me and let me know your comments or email me to the church so that we can make a decision based on everybody. As we worship today, we're, we're happy to have the Rutz girls with us. Yay! Willow and Joe are here, and they're enjoying Monty. And I thank Doug for assisting with liturgy. We have a new face today. And Heather, of course, is here, and Deanne, and we have a visitor, Gwen. So welcome. Um, enjoy worship. So let's worship the Lord God. The call to worship. Jesus said, anyone who receives you, receives me, and anyone who receives me receives the Father who sent me. Sisters and brothers, boys and girls, we gather together in the presence of the God who receives us with open arms, who loves us unconditionally, and who bids us to do the same to one another. Let us worship God together.
prayer confession. The difficult ones, the needy ones, the ones that are hard to spend time with, the ones who challenge us, the ones who confront us. Sometimes we choose to not welcome others by simply refusing to. Sometimes it's not really about the others, it's about us. We are uncomfortable. We feel guilty. We prefer to allow, or we, we prefer to follow brighter, shinier people. We worry about what will make us look like good Christians, and we fail to recognize our blindness. Forgive us for making mistaking the world values over what you value. Forgive us for choosing comfort over servanthood. Forgive us for our inability to welcome others and remind us to love with the love of your Son, Jesus Christ. In these waters of baptism, we are reminded that we are cleansed, and we are cleansed so that we might go out and forgive others as well. With the baptismal waters dripping from your forehead, my friend, know that you are forgiven and be at peace. for all the rain because I have lots of good stuff in my garden growing. Ah, garden is growing. Do you guys have a garden? What? Oh. <laughs> the cat kept going to the bathroom in it? Yeah, that's not a good thing for a garden. Gwen, would you like to tell us what you're thankful for? Grateful for? I'm grateful that I'm in the church. Right now, instead of sitting at home, I appreciate this. Yes, well, we're so glad that you joined us. Everybody is welcome to join us on Thursdays at 11.30 if you'd like to join us. It is, um, you forget how much you miss the organ until they, Heather plays, and you forget how much you just miss this place, don't you? Doug, what are you thankful for? Uh, I am thankful to work for a company that uh, allows us to work from home during this uh, pandemic. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. My husband is working from home and he's loving not having to commute to Tyson's. He's yeah. spoiled rotten. Heather, are you still in here? I am grateful that I only have five more days of being a protester 
And five more days of what? As Dean of Winchester ADO. Ah, five more days of Dean is awesome. Uh, you've been working hard. So I am thankful because I had a wonderful weekend with my family, but even more so than that, my son turned 21, and so I'm thankful that he is healthy and happy at 21, and this is where you uh, drop your jaws and say, you can't be old enough to have a 21-year-old. So thank you for all of that. So, I have some questions for you. The sermon today is about welcoming people. So how do we welcome people? What are some of the ways we do that? As a church or as people in our homes? How do we welcome people? Hello, that's a good one, yep. Yeah. What else do we do? Tea. We what? And hi. When somebody comes to your house, do you give them something to eat sometimes? Yeah. Yeah, you'll usually offer them a drink, a cup of water, or something to eat. What about here at the church? What do we do to welcome people here at church? We pray. We say good morning. There are lots of ways we do that. So the next question I have for you is do we welcome everybody at the church? Yeah? What if somebody comes in the church that doesn't look like us or doesn't speak our language? That'd be hard, wouldn't it? Especially if they don't speak our language. Should we tell them to go away and go to another church? No, why not? It wouldn't be the right thing. It would be rather mean, wouldn't it? Well, in your packets that you're going to get this week, I have a job for you. Do you guys like to color? Okay, so you're going to get a sign, and all I'm going to write on it is welcome. And I want you to think of all the different people that we welcome into church, or animals like Monty here. Yeah, all the different things we do to welcome people. And then when we get to come back to worship, I'm going to put them all over the walls to make sure everybody knows that everybody is welcome. Can you guys do that for me? So you'll get a packet on your doorstep, and it'll have a poster board, and you'll have you'll each have one, and you'll have to color it for me. Okay? Let's say a prayer. Lord, we thank you that you remind us to welcome others. Strangers, people that look like us and people that don't. People that speak our language and those that speak a different language. Help us to be a little more uncomfortable so that all can be comfortable in your church and in your work. Through your son's name, amen. Our first scripture reading is Romans 6, uh, verses 12 through 23. Uh, or the Lord. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your moral bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present. Your, member, your members to God as instruments of righteousness for sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What is then should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you pre present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, the slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God. Thank you, having once been slaves to sin, having become obedient from the heart to the, to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you have been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in the human terms because of the natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater inequity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sacrification. For sanctification. Yeah, sanctification. Thank you. <laughs> when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to the righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been for free from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. 
The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord, the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Doug. So should I sin so that grace can abound? No, we are slaves to Christ. And slave's a hard word to, to speak and to say, but um, in that, we recognize that our personhood, all of who we are, belongs to Christ, and that's the blessing. As we go to prayer today, we have um, a couple blessings. Uh, Deanne, you're back doing better? Uh, getting there. Sherry said hers is doing better. She was here at the office yesterday, so we're glad to hear that. Um, Dr. Arani is slowly still improving, and Richard Johansson, who we keep in our daily prayers, is taking morning hikes, and I just thank the Lord that God's got his healing hand on him. Um, I ask for prayers for a family, um, the Hazel family. Eleanor Hazel passed away last night. Um, you may know them as the Bill Hazel Construction Company in Northern Virginia. So we have our prayers for the Hazel family. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord, you would have us welcome anybody and everybody. You would have us keep the doors to the church wide open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You, O oh Lord, would make this place and all places a place of comfort and sanctuary, a place of welcome and hospitality. 
but the world gets in the way. The world gets in the way and we recognize that the sins of the world, the world values that we, that we bind to are not yours. And so your church has become that place that is comfortable to those that we know, those that look like us. And you, O oh God, in creation, made this wonderful, diverse planet with all different flowers and animals and nothing looking the same. And you ask us to love in that way as well. And yet we fail as your church, as your children, as the world. Right now, in this time, Lord, we ask your prayer, our prayers be on the communities that need healing. We ask you, Lord, to put your blessing on those that serve our communities, whether they wear a badge or they drive a big red fire truck, Lord, they drive an ambulance, keep them safe. Put first and foremost in their minds their oath to serve the community and bring about purity and wholeness. We ask your blessing, Lord, on those that are sick, those that care for the sick. We ask your, your strength, Lord, your courage and your wisdom to stand up in this time to speak your word, even when it conflicts with the world's word. Remind us that we may not all think alike, but we are all your children. Remind us, Lord, that though we may disagree, Christ is the bond which ties us together. And send your spirit, that hovering spirit that first was over creation's waters and then woke up the disciples with flames on their head and sent them out into the world to baptize and tell your word. Wake us up, Lord, from our complacency. Help us to use this time because it's so different that we're stuck in one place. We're isolated, but Lord, let us not retreat from your word. Let us not get lost in, in the worries of today. Let us not fall apart from our families because we're spending too much time together. Help us, Lord, to build community in new and innovative and creative ways. Give us the strength, Lord, as your church to reach out beyond these walls, to speak a new word to the community. Give us the courage, Lord, as your church to speak out against the hatred in this world. Give us wisdom, Lord, the wisdom of Solomon, the wisdom that you give to us in Scripture. For the wisdom of your, your word, Lord, is so much more than the world around us. Speak to our church leaders, not only here, but everywhere. Let the church be a beacon of hope and light and grace. Let us listen for your still small voice so that we might know what you are calling the church to be in this time and in this place. We ask your blessing, Lord, on those that are grieving. There is so much, much hurt in the world. So for the Hazel family, Lord, let your spirit just move among them as they grieve. Let them laugh and tell stories and remember. Be with our community as we grieve the things that once were. Help us to grieve those but still move forward. Be with those that are sick. We give you thanks for Dr. Irani and Richard Johansson and your constant presence with them. We give you thanks, Lord, for Sherry's back feeling better. We ask you to continue to heal Deanne and to continue to heal Harriet and be with those that feel so isolated in their homes. Let your spirit be their presence and their guide. Lord, all of these things we lift up to you, knowing that when we pray through your son's name, you hear our prayers. So let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Doug's about to be really mad at me. Because I gave him the long scripture. Mine's just two verses. Yep. Sorry. But it is the lectionary passage, and this is Matthew chapter 10. I'm going to take this mask off. 
form. It's Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 through 42, and it's about welcoming, as you can probably guess. And interestingly enough, the other lectionary passages that I said last week was that of Abraham sacrificing Isaac, and that is one tough passage to preach. So I opted for the gospel. This is Matthew 40 through 10, 40 through 42. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever goes gives even a cold cup of water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, None of these will lose their reward. The prophet Isaiah says, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. Thanks be to God. Welcome is the word for the day. Welcome, and it's a great word, but we're going to kind of dig into it a little more. In 1979, Tim Hansel um, published a book that was titled when I relax, I feel guilty. And I have to say, I'm doing a lot of relaxing and I do feel guilty. But this is what he says. I'd like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of him to make me love a black man or pick beats with a migrant. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in an empty paper sack. I'd like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. $3 worth of God. Because welcoming is hard and it challenges us. And I constantly find myself thinking of, of our Matthew 25 church. And, you know, it says that whenever you did it to the least of these, you did it unto me. Whenever you feed someone, you're feeding me. Whenever you give someone a home and welcome them, you're welcoming me. And, and that we're Matthew 25 church. And that's important to me. But it's also hard. Because I wonder who Jesus is sometimes. Like you, I will go to Riverton Commons. And when I come out, there's always somebody there with a, a sign asking for money or something. And as I divert my eyes and try to look the other way, that nagging voice in my head always goes, this could be Jesus. Is that you, God? Matthew 25 is a really hard scripture passage to live into because it should disrupt our comfort zones but nowhere in the Bible does it say you can just mail in a $3 check. Now, this is where I have to step out and from minister mode, get into elder mode, but we do need your checks. Please fill up with your tithing. Um, Deanne is our treasurer. You're welcome. Now, back to the sermon. You can't just get $3 worth of God. You're either all in or not. You gotta, gotta be a servant, be a person in the disciple mode, or not. In fact, the Apostle Paul says that you can't be a lukewarm Christian. You can't have a $3 worth of God. you got to be hot or cold. It doesn't mean you can't be who you want to be, but it means that you have to take on the act of discipleship in the world. And what we as the church call that is radical hospitality. And that's a really cool word, radical hospitality. And it kind of rolls off the tongue. I like to think that we are radically hospitable here, but we're not. We do the normal. Yeah, even Deanne goes, ah. <laughs> we welcome people. But do we welcome everybody? We say all are welcome. But do we live that out and breathe it? Because nothing about being a Christian says we just get $3 worth of God. Thus, Christianity tells us, take up your cross and follow me. Now, radical hospitality, when we look at the word radical, we actually think out of the ordinary, or a really hard word right now to understand is revolutionary, because we are in the midst of a change. 
We are, we are in the midst of a revolution. And that's hard and it hurts and it's uncomfortable, but that's what radical hospitality is. So what does it look like when you receive someone, a stranger, not just being polite, but receiving them with radical hospitality? Hospitality is a word that actually has a spiritual history. Monasteries grew up around the fifth centuries and strangers could come to a monastery and always be welcome. Always be welcome, time, any time of day or night. And of course, you probably know that hospitality, you can think of hospitals and hospice, the place where we can go to be received and healed. The rule of Benedict in one of the monasteries, actually the wonderful quote that comes from that is, listen with the ear of your heart. Listen with the ear of your heart. Now, there's actually a study out by Robert Putnam and it's an interesting study, and it may not be surprising, but he talks about isolation. And this is kind of ironic because right now we're very isolated. We're very in our own little places, in our own little worlds. And he talks about that physical isolation, and we're experiencing, but ponder how that feels now. And I was just talking to Doug, it's hard. And Joe can't wait to go out and do things, can you, Joe? That's right now, imagine that all the time, being isolated. He wanted to find out when diverse groups of people come together in the same area, a neighborhood perhaps, what they do. When these diverse groups, and diversity of course is a big word, topic word right now, he found that when you have a diverse neighborhood of different people, we tend to hunger down. We tend to, to come into ourselves. We watch more TV. We have fewer friends. We do fewer community projects. We don't interact with one another. And as a result, the trust and interaction between people starts to diminish because we're most comfortable with people that look like us. Many of you know my family just moved and we moved from one of those great neighborhoods where everybody's my age and all my best friends were within earshot. Each of my kids had all their best friends growing up in the neighborhood. It was a great place. Everybody looked like me. And then we moved out here to the country and we have land and we've been here for a month or two months. And I have to confess that I haven't met my neighbors. I wave at them when they go down the driveway. I know one. Yes, I do know one. <laughs> um, and I watch more TV huh. when I have Wi-Fi. I have fewer friends that I hang out with. In community projects, I can't even get myself to plant a flower. So Putnam's right. When these results came in, he distributed his findings, and he was a dyed-in-the-wool progressive and very pro-diversity. But he said, in the face of diversity, most of us retreat. And that's sadly true. Diversity is everywhere. It smacks us in the face when we turn on the TV, when we scroll through social media. So what are we doing? More often than not, I hear people saying, I'm turning it off. I can't take it. Yes? I just can't take the news anymore. I can't take the fighting on social media. I'm just gonna turn it off. And in doing so, we start hunkering down because we recognize that maybe our human bodies can't take it. But we also recognize that it's easier to pretend that it doesn't exist than to actually confront it and doing something radical about it. Something that might risk your reputation. Something that might make your neighbor mad. Radical hospitality. It's getting a little rough. And it's a whole lot easier when there are rules to follow. Department stores have rules. The customer's always right. Okay. But that if you work in a department store in a company, there are rules that you have to follow. And that makes life easier. The government. When you're in a job, there are rules you have to follow. All of these different places have rules, but we as the church, 
we've forgotten our rules. We've forgotten who we are. And we have a guide. We have a book. We have this. We may not have policies written by lawyers and, and all the smart people in the world, but we have this that tells us what to do. So radical hospitality is a spiritual practice. What does that look like in your life? Not talking about just opening the doors. That's easy. Not even talking about just offering a glass of cold water. Because that's easy. Talking about speaking out, using your voice, even when it speaks against the worldly values that we hold so firm. Speaking out and using your voice to further the word of God instead of the other words that are in the world. And to make this church and all churches and all places a place of welcome. This is a mission statement, and it actually does not follow any of the rules of writing a mission statement, because a mission statement is supposed to be just a few words, one sentence, so you can remember it. But this Oregon church, this is their mission statement, and I love it. We extend a special welcome to those who are single, married, divorced, widowed, gay, straight, filthy rich, dirt poor, crying newborns, brokenhearted, or in need of a safe place. We welcome you if you can sing like Pacelli or if you can't carry a tune in a bucket. You're welcome here if you're just browsing, just woke up, or just got out of jail. We extend a special welcome to those who are over 60 but not grown up yet, and to teenagers who are growing up too fast. We welcome soccer moms, NASCAR dads, latte sippers, vegetarians, junk food eaters. We welcome you if you're having problems or you're down in the dumps or if you don't like organized religion because we've been there too. If you blew all your offering at the casino, you're welcome here. We offer a special welcome to those who think the earth is flat, work too hard, don't work, can't spell, or because grandma's in town and wanted to go to church. We offer a special welcome to those who could use a prayer right now. Those that had religion shoved down your throat as a kid, or got lost in traffic and ended up here by mistake. We welcome tourists, seekers, doubters, bleeding hearts in you. And I love that, because it, it makes us a little uncomfortable. It, it makes us a little uncomfortable because it says they welcome if you're just out of jail. And as the church, we like to do background checks. And we want to know if, if we're putting ourselves at risk, don't we? We want to question what people's motives are. We want to know if we can trust them. If they're sitting in our pews, we want to know where weird customs they have. We want to know who they've been with right now. What's your COVID circle? We want to know what their intentions are. We want to know their language even when they speak a different one and we say you're not welcome. Because as a church, that's what makes us comfortable. And that's a challenge. In the movie Avatar, girls, have you seen the movie Avatar? Have they seen it? Probably not. I don't, I don't know what it's rated, but in the movie Avatar, it's a movie, it's a blockbuster hit about science fiction planet and humans going and trying to understand the planet and actually take it over. But the indigenous people of the planet, the Navi, have a way of expressing love and caring for one another in a special way. And I hope you were paying attention last week, because we're about to draw on that. Instead of saying hello or hi or howdy, they say, I see you. I see you. And that's a beautiful thing to say. I see you. I see who you are. I recognize you as the individual that God created. Do you see the cashier clerk as a person with their own story to tell? Or are they just somebody ringing up your groceries? Do you see the teacher that is working with your children online and her individual struggles? Or is that just somebody to fill the need of education? Do you see the people around you? Do you see the nurse that works hours upon hours but still has a family at home to care for that she worries about each and every day? I see you to see someone else's story 
And last week, when Hagar and Ishmael were, were sent out into the wilderness, we remember that Hagar gave God a name, and that is huge. It's the first name for God in Scripture. And Hagar says, you are the God who sees. You are the God who sees. And we as the church are not very good at seeing people. We need to work on that. We need to see them as individuals. We need to see the people in our community that are hurting. And more than just see them, we need to speak out our voice when theirs is silenced. And you're thinking, okay, that's great. Great, Pastor Gary, but I'm locked up at home, so I'm gonna wait till COVID's over to do that. Good luck. There's a hint. Turn the news back on. I know it's hard. Listen to different points of view. Educate yourself. Hear the stories of the people in our communities from all sides, from both sides, from every corner. Learn what the voice is that God is calling us to speak. And here's another hint, and you never thought I'd say it. Use social media. Use your voice. And that's hard because it's, it's brutal out there. But people listen. Use your voice to speak up for those that are silent. To tell others that the church is indeed a welcoming place. Use your voice in the, with elections, with your elected officials. And you know what? We're not going to agree. Most of the time we're not. And that's okay. Because offering someone a cup of cold water doesn't mean we have to agree. Welcoming somebody and offering them that cup of cold water that Jesus challenges us to do says, I see you. Let's open a conversation. And when you open the conversation, you begin to learn. We're not that far off. And we can be welcoming to everybody. So I charge you to go. Communicate with others. Use the platforms around you to speak God's voice in the midst of all the worldly voices that are so loud right now. And above all, practice that radical, revolutionary, out of the ordinary hospitality that God calls us to do and be, not just in the church, but in every corner of our world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hello. Oh my God. Hi. Are you new? It's nice to meet you. Okay, so we have a program. We have a nursing home. We have any kiddos. That's information on the staff. Um, we also have a soup kitchen. We always are looking for volunteers, so we get them to come on every Thursday. Right. And of course, you want to know about our pastors. We have some information we yeah. have to meet her. Okay. And just like some general information about the staff of the church. And we want to make sure you know. Uh -huh. So, welcome, welcome. I'll take you to see the pastor right now. <laughs> Thank you. 
this time of prayer for offering. I see the good which God's people do when they work together. Together we bring the word and love of God and the teaching of Jesus Christ to each other, our children and our community. We bring shelter to the homeless, feed the hungry, and teach the children. We bring communion and companionship to the lost. We visit the sick and the imprisoned, and we come together in a worshiping community of believers so that we can continue to do these things and to do them more abundantly. We invite you to bring your treasure, your time, and your talents, and yourself. So I know something's got to give. I know that something is me, and I hope and pray that it is you too. You may give online via Tithe or T I T H dot L Y dot com, or you can mail the office. Praise God from our hands and feet in the service of your son Jesus Christ use them to bring about your kingdom use them to challenge us to live into the radical hospitality that you have set before us through your son's name bless them use them multiply them as only you can in the name of the Father Son and Holy Spirit amen my friends you are sent out from this virtual space into maybe another virtual space to speak your voice to speak god's voice above all others because the church needs to be seen and heard in this time and in this place so i challenge you i charge you i command you as jesus commanded his disciples to go out into the world baptizing all of those that you see teaching them the words that he has commanded us and remember that always wherever you go god goes with you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. <laughs> Thank you. 